today we want to have this uh, kind of pinnacle talk. Uh, we're going to wrap up this series next week. Uh, we've been in this series for several weeks called Far From Home. And knowing that we were building towards this, this week of homecoming. And so I, I would be very remiss to say, if I didn't say, welcome home. Right? Welcome home. And we want this to be a place where you feel at home. We want this to be a place where it doesn't matter how long you haven't been here, that when you come here, you always feel right at home. We want this to be a place where, you know, and, and hey, look, you know, you might go to somebody's house and you might be that close to them where you can kick off your shoes and throw your feet up on the coffee table or whatever. Well, you know, you can do that here. We got people who do that here. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and, and so we just want you to be you. Right? We want you to be you. It's not your job to be me or to be someone else. And in fact, if you try to do that, you're going to fail every time. God has created you uniquely to be you. And we want to celebrate the diversity. We want to, we want to celebrate the uniqueness that makes New Vision who New Vision is. Because I can tell you this, and I've been in a lot of churches. And I'm not just saying this because I'm the lead pastor. I'm telling you this because this is the truth. There is no other church like this church. <laughs> Right? There is no other church like this church. And I mean, I'm just telling you that just straight up. People are like, do you like where you are? Do you like what you're doing? I'm like, yeah, I love it because I couldn't do what I do anywhere else. There's nobody else that would take me, you know, and maybe you all feel the same way. There's no other church that would take you. But I want you to know this. We're going to take all those that nobody else wants. You can come here. Because this is a place, this is a place, and we all know, we all understand what it feels like to be an outcast. We all understand what it feels like to have been bullied. We all understand what it feels like to be rejected or to be cast aside or to be not paid attention to. And I want you to know this, okay, I'm not going to get it all right every time because I'm just as messed up as you are. Okay, so the next time you try to blame me for something, just remember you probably did it too. But we can all be broken together, right? Amen. We can all be messed up together. And, and, and the thing about church is this, is that God has a church for a reason. Not for perfect people to get together. It's for imperfect people to get together to demonstrate the grace and the goodness of God. Amen? Amen. And so today, I want to say to you, welcome home. Because home is a place and you know, if, if I were to ask you to describe your home, you'd have a really hard time really truly describing it. Because to be honest with you, home is quite an elusive term. Most of you have probably lived in several houses in your life. But there's probably one that you still call home. You know, when I think about home, and I talk about home, and even though I, I recently you know, purchased a house over here... Um, I still call North Carolina home, and it's kind of strange, isn't it, that I call that home, but it's because that's where most of my memories are. It's not because that's where I live. It's not because that's where I even have, I mean, I have family there, but I call it home because that's where all the things that were so special to me at one time were so special. But you know what's happened? What's happened is this, is I've gone back home lately. And it doesn't feel like home anymore. I, I've driven by my old house. And I'm just like, wow, we had a great time there. But it's not home. It's not home. You see, it's really hard to think about and put home in the terms that we really, really use to explain what home is. Because, you see, home is not just about a location. Home's not about a habitation. Home is about a relation. You see, your home matters most about where the people are you love most. That's where home is. You can live in a home in a house, but just because you live there doesn't make it a home. It's all about your relationship with the people in that 
This is why we wanted to have this celebration today, to bring back so many people who have been with us in the past, because that's what makes New Vision home. It's the relationships that we have with one another. It's being able to reminisce together, not just to sit there by yourself and think about, oh, yeah, that was a great memory. No, it's able to be able to talk about that and to say, yeah, we, we remember that together. We remember it together. Well, today we're going to look at this passage in Luke 15, and I will do my best to be short on my words because I know we've already been past some of our normal ritual time of being in church. And, uh, but, but, but today is a special day. And, you know, we can't ignore the importance and the value of looking at God's Word together. Amen. And so I want us to look at the prodigal's God this morning. We've been talking a lot about the prodigal son. We've been talking about a lot about the father and their relationship. But today I want you to, to consider this God that is depicted in this story. The Bible tells us in Luke 15, 17 through 24, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. So, what makes sense? <laughs> I'm going to go home to my father, and I'm going to say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So, he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. And filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the fatted calf that we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. I just think that's great. And so there was a party. And so there was a celebration. You know, when people will say, oh, you know, God's against partying. No, he's not. God's not against partying. He just wants you to have the right kind of party. Right? <laughs> Right? Right? I mean, Jesus, his first miracle was at a party. He turned water into wine, right? So it's like God is all about a party. I think we as Christians, we don't really know how to celebrate the right things. We celebrate the wrong things. And that's why God is against it. The Bible tells us this, that every time there is a sinner who comes home, there is a party in heaven. I want you to know today that if you end up moving into a relationship with Jesus, there's going to be a party for you today. And it may not be an anniversary party. It's going to be a birthday party, right? Because God is into celebrating, and he wants to celebrate what he's doing in and through our lives. I really think it's kind of interesting because this story is unique from all the others in this chapter, right? Look at what happens in the first part of this chapter. I mean, you get a, you got a sheep who gets lost. Yeah, that happens. Coin gets lost. And so you would assume that the son gets lost. But the son doesn't get lost. Now you've all lost a child before. In Walmart. In Publix. You've lost your child. And then you lost your mind for a little while, right? <laughs> Until you found them. But this is not the case of this father. This father did not randomly lose his child. And so it's distinctly different from the other two parables in this, this chapter. This father, his son says, I'm out. I'm leaving. See ya. I hope you bite the dust soon. That's what he's saying. He's like, I don't really care about you. I'm out of here. Just give me my inheritance now. That's a big difference between getting lost, right? This, this son is leaving. I don't know if you've ever had that kind of loss or experience before, but that's, that's devastating. You know, the, the shepherd, when he loses the sheep, he searches for the sheep, right? When the woman loses the coin, she searches for the coin. But, but what does the father do? This is what's so crazy is that you would think the father should just 
I mean, he should just leave and go after the son and beg him, don't leave, son, stay. Don't leave, son, stay. But the father doesn't do that. I just thought this was kind of interesting. I mean, doesn't the father love the son? Doesn't, I mean, what is the father doing here? He is practicing some what? Tough love, right? It's tough on the father, I promise you. Y'all heard this before, right? When, when you get disciplined, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you, right? I promise you, this was not easy for the father to sit there and see the son walking away. And yet, what does the father do? The father lets him do that. It's not because the father didn't love him. In fact, it's because the father did love him. The father was like, okay, I love you enough. And you all have all heard this phrase before. If you love me, let me go. Right? If you, if you love me, or if, if it's real love, if you let it go, what's it going to do? It's going to come back. Right? If it's real love. And so, in this story, we see this picture of the father letting them, letting him go. It reminded me of that song that I was telling you guys about last week. I went to see that guy, Michael Card. Actually, I didn't get to see him. I got lost. And, uh, and this, was the, this was one of the songs that was happening during the time I was lost. And this, this chorus of this song reminded me, Could it be that you make your presence known so often by your absence? Think about that for a second. Could it be that questions tell us more than answers ever do? Could it be that you would really rather die than live without us? Could it be the only answer that means anything is you? The father let the son go. And you know what? When the son was in that pig pit, all he could think about was, man, I don't belong here. This is not my home. How did I end up here? What was I thinking? And the father wasn't there, right? He wasn't physically there, but you know what? The father was here. The father was here, and he could not escape him. Some of you may have been trying to escape God. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to run into him tomorrow. And everywhere you turn, you're going to see God. You know why? Because God loves you. And God's trying to get your attention. And sometimes God's going to speak to you through a billboard. Sometimes he's going to speak to you through a friend. Sometimes he's going to speak to you through a preacher, bald preacher with earrings on stage. <laughs> but you know what? What you need to remember is that God is trying to speak to you. Don't say, oh, God's not trying to get my attention. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And just because he is not doing what you think he should be doing to get your attention doesn't mean he's not getting your attention, right? You know, I heard this illustration the other day about there was a parent walking with, with their child, and the parent picked up the child and was carrying the child. And they embraced and hugged, and then the father put the child down and, they were walking. Did that father's love change at all from the time that he was embracing that child to the time he put the child down? No, not at all. The love didn't change at all. What changed is this, is that for a moment the child felt the father's embrace. But at times we don't always feel our father's embrace, do we? And when we don't feel the father's embrace, this is what we're saying. Oh, you don't love me anymore. He is still there, walking right beside you. And just because you don't feel him doesn't mean he doesn't love you. And just because you don't feel him doesn't mean he's not right there beside you. It's just we choose to ignore sometimes what God is really doing in and around us. Many of you remember Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And this boy, this prodigal boy in that pig pit was thinking, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. How many of my father's servants are there? And they have tons of food to eat. And yet here I am. I'm starving because I made bad choices. 
But isn't that what we need to do? Is we need to admit that it was our choice that got us where we are? I mean, wouldn't it be ridiculous for the boy to be in the pig pit saying, man, my dad just, my dad's just the worst dad in the world. I mean, he gave me everything I wanted. And look where I'm at. And yet some of us do that with God. God, God has answered so many prayers for me. And what do you do? You still go out and you complain that God has not been good to you. Oh, my goodness. God has been so good to us. How could we ever blame where we are on him? It is not his fault. It is our poor choices. The most sensible thing you can do, and I said this last week, is that you can return to your father. This is what this boy did. The Bible tells us that when he came to his senses, when he finally realized, wow, what am I doing here? This is ridiculous. I don't have to be here. I don't have to be in this situation. He said, you know what? I'm going to change it. Isn't, doesn't that make sense? If you don't like your job, you know what? You live in America. You can get another one. Right? I mean, people are hiring everywhere. If you don't like something, you can pretty much change almost anything you want to change. And so quit complaining about where you are and start doing something to get out of there. You don't have to be there. You can make a difference. You just got to make a choice. And yet some people are just going to blame it on everybody else. Look at what this young man says. He doesn't blame it on anybody else. He says, I'm going to go home. And this is what I'm going to say. He's, he's, he's getting this message all together, right? He's like, I'm just going to go home and I'm going to say, you know, Father, I've sinned. Now that would be a big step for some of us. To just admit we have sinned. For such a small word, it's hard for people to say. Sin. But we need to admit it. He says, I have sinned. Look who I've sinned against. I've sinned against heaven and you. And you've done the same thing. You've sinned against heaven and you've sinned against other people. We've all done that. And we all still do. None of us are perfect. I want you to understand that our sin is never isolated. It's never just you that's affected by your sin. Other people are affected by your sin. Other people are affected by your choices. And this is why it's so important that you don't make life-changing decisions on the spur of a moment. You just don't do that. Because it doesn't just affect you. It affects your home. It affects your family. It affects your church. You know, it's, it's, it's like, look, the things that you do affect the people around you. And even if you don't know them all that well, it affects people. Be careful what you choose to do. He says, against you and you alone have I sinned, have I done wrong and evil in your sight. This is David who's speaking in Psalm 51. When David commits adultery with Bathsheba, this is what he says to God. He says, against you, against you are the one that I sinned against. We have to realize that when we sin, our primary sin is against God first. But it's acted out oftentimes with the people around us. Sometimes the hardest thing you're going to have to say is, will you forgive me? It's not saying I'm sorry. Although that might be hard for some people to say. But I need your forgiveness. And there is a difference. This young man, he's willing to come back and say, I have sinned. I have done wrong. And I need to be forgiven. He says this, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. No longer worthy. Listen, you are never, ever going to be worthy. You're never going to be worthy. The only one who is worthy is Jesus. We sing worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb, right? Because he is the only one who is worthy. But that doesn't mean you have no worth. 
That doesn't mean you got to walk around saying, oh, I'm just nothing. You know, I'm a nobody. Oh, even God has to. He just loves me because he's God. God loves you because you are valuable. God loves you because you are unique. God loves you because he created you. And listen, he is not up in heaven with an angry scowl on his face just thinking, you know, just wait, just you just wait. You go ahead and sin one more time. But make my day. Right? God's not doing that. God looks down on each and every one of you with great love. And even though we are not worthy of his love, we are the beneficiaries of his love. We get to experience something we would never, ever deserve simply because we are valuable to God. And I know it may be hard to believe that you have value to God. There are times when your self-worth feels about like this. But don't you ever think that that's what your self-worth is to God. God highly values you. In fact, so much so That he gave his only, one and only son for you. The next time you start thinking you have no value, you just just remember that. God, God gave something that is eternal. He gave his one and only son for you. And that's how much he values you. The value of oneself doesn't need to be through the lens of sin but through the lens of the Savior. Don't look at yourself through your own eyes. Look at yourself through God's eyes. Look at other people through God's eyes. He looks at us differently, and I'm so glad for that. We need to look at other people differently. And when we do look at other people differently, one thing's for sure, we will extend grace much more freely. So, he returned home. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. I like the King James Version where it says he fell on his neck. (laughs) It's like, how did that happen? I don't understand that. It's like, did he trip and just like, oops. But it says he ran to him, he embraced him, he kissed him. Even though the father didn't go out looking for him, the father was searching for him the whole time. Listen, just because you, you moms and dads, grandmas, y'all know this, you might not be there with your child, but you've got connections, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know what your child's doing. <laughs> you know where your child is, right? you you got that network going on. And I promise you, this wealthy father, he knew where his son was. He got the word what was happening with his son and where his son was going and what his son was doing. He knew. And so he's just sitting there waiting, saying, one day he's coming back. Money's going to dry up. He's going to get hungry. Nobody's been feeding him. (laughs) Probably because the father said, don't feed the boy. Right? (laughs) Let him come home. (laughs) Let him come home. Right? So the father is searching, he's looking, and he's waiting for the boy to come home. And one day, he finally does. I want you to understand this. God is never moving away from you. He's always running toward you. God is not ever moving away from you. God doesn't move like that. If you're far from God, it's not because God moved, it's because you did. Home was always there. I mean, the father was always there. It wasn't the boy, right? I mean, the father, it was the boy who moved away. It was the boy who ran away and said, I just want to do my own thing. The father is always consistent. And he's always available. He's always there. The truth is that grace meets us where we are and takes you in as you are. But it doesn't leave you as you are. Look at what the father said. The father said, hey, you know... It's time for you to get a new robe. I got the wrong verse up there. It's time for you to get a new robe, right? It's time for you to get a new ring, right? It's time for you to get new sandals, right? Because you are not going to stay that way. 
That might be how you coming in, but that ain't how you're going to stay. I think it's amazing. It's amazing that this father does not see his mud-covered son and say, oh, uh, th 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 don't touch me. I got on some clean clothes, right? I just bought this tie at Belks for 50 bucks. <laughs> Ain't going to get it dirty. It's silk, right? The father doesn't care about what the son has been in, what the son looks like, what the son smells like. He's like, I'm just glad you're home. Welcome home. And when the father embraces him, right, this is a picture of our God. You want to know what God is like? Look at this father. Our God is the same way. So many people feel like, well, I can't go to church because I'm not perfect. No, it's a, it's a great place for imperfect people. I can't go to church because my life is so messed up. Well, that's all right. This is where messed up people come. You know what? Jesus said, I didn't come for the righteous. I came for those who were sick and messed up. I came for the sinner. I came for those people who don't have it all together. And he's painting a picture for us of this father who's not just there prim and proper, all dressed up and unapproachable. We have a God who is very approachable. We have a God who is Willing and waiting for us to, if you will, crawl up into his lap. And it doesn't matter how dirty you've been. He always welcomes you home. The father says, quick, 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 quick. We don't have time to waste. Do this right now, right? And these people are jumping on his word. And they go and they get him these things. And they bring it out. And this young man is elevated back to a son's status immediately. Some of you feel like, i got to work my way back. That's what this boy thought. I, I'm just going to be a hired servant. I mean, don't even call me your son anymore. Nobody else recognizes me that way because I left the family. I walked out. It was all on me. It's not your fault. I'm the one to blame. But the father says, I'm not hearing that. No. You're still my child. And you know what? No child of mine is going to be a servant like this. No. You're my child. And I'm going to treat you like a child. I want you to understand this morning that once you come back to Jesus, it's forgiven. It's done. You don't have to, you don't have to grovel. You don't have to carry it around. You don't have to beat yourself up. Jesus will forgive you and cleanse you just like that. But that doesn't mean you're not going to have struggles. Right? It doesn't mean you're not going to fall down. They, the father and the son, they still had some things to work through, I promise you. <laughs> right? But in that moment, nothing else mattered except this son had come. what does the father do? He says, kill the calf. We've been fattening that thing, waiting for a moment like this. And there's no greater celebration than what's happening right now. The Pharisees are having a cow at this moment. <laughs> what are you talking about? The Pharisees, these religious people, right? They're just like, there is no way you can be Telling a story about a father who's just going to forgive a child just like that. Impossible. They're having a cow. And, and Jesus is like, you don't understand my father. You don't understand the God that you say you're serving. You don't understand him. Because my father who is in heaven loves every single person right where they are. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believed in him would not perish but could have everlasting life. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And so this is a picture of Jesus himself. You didn't know Jesus was in the story, did you? Because you see, when you sin, there has to be an atonement for sin. And so the calf has to be killed. Because blood has to be shed for our sin. 
Jesus weaves this into the story and he says, you know what? There was, there was forgiveness, but there was also atonement because an animal lost its life. But because that animal lost its life, we get to celebrate. And because Jesus Christ himself gave his life, you know what? We get to celebrate. Amen? Because Jesus gave himself for us, we now have life. It's amazing how Jesus weaves himself into this story. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Jesus said, the whole reason I came was so that we could have a party. There's a story of a, of a, a, a father and a son. Much like this parable, they had a falling out. The son had... Stolen some things, and even though they were a prominent family, of course, the young man got caught, and he got put in jail. He served 15 years. And, of course, it was disgraceful. So the young man, when he's being released, sends a letter to his family and says, Hey, Mom and Dad, um, I know that I disgraced the family. I'm coming home, or at least I hope I'm coming home. I'm being released next week. If you are willing to forgive me, would you just tie a yellow ribbon around the tree? When I come by on the bus, if I see the yellow ribbon, I'll know all is forgiven and I can come home. And so the young man gets released from prison, gets his ticket, and he's riding home. And when he gets to where the tree is, he doesn't just see one yellow ribbon. He sees the whole neighborhood standing there ready to welcome him back home. It's like they were doing this. Come home, right? Come home, right? It all went right there. Come home, right? It's like, I need more ribbons. They're all right there. What's going on? Come home, right? He is sending these ribbons to you this morning. And he's saying this. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? You don't have to wait to come home. You're always welcome home. And so if the band would come on up. I want to ask you this question this morning. Some of you have been waiting for a yellow ribbon You've been locked in your jail, and you feel like, you know, I just don't know. I just don't know if I'm going to be accepted. I just don't know if I'm going to be welcome home. And this is what I feel like the father is saying. This is what I feel like the father and the prodigal was saying. He was thinking this, son, just, well, come home. Well, Come home. Just come home. You're always going to be welcome here. What are you waiting for? Just come home. And you know, today, you don't have to wait. The Bible tells us that God has extended his love to us, each and every one of us. And there would be no greater thing that could happen today than for you to return home. It's only one step, right? It's only, it's only one turn back to the road of the Father. And today, you can start that journey. Maybe you've never, ever moved into a relationship with God as your Heavenly Father. I want you to know this. There's a big old ribbon, yellow ribbon, tied up in heaven. But it's not tied to an oak tree. It's tied to a cross. And on that cross, on that cross is the picture, right, of each and every one of us. And the Father saying, you're always welcome here. At the foot of the cross, 
there's always room for you. Welcome home. Welcome home. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your love. A love that is beyond our comprehension. But today, we want to celebrate. And as your word says, that when that sinner, when that young man, when that son came home, the party began. God, you know in just a few moments, we're set to celebrate 15 years of ministry. And God, there's no greater way for us to kick off that celebration than to see someone today give their lives to Jesus Christ. And so, right there where you're sitting, do you have that relationship with God the Father? Do you have that relationship with Jesus the Son? Does the Holy Spirit live within you? Because the Bible tells us this, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he will put a new robe on you, the robe of righteousness. And he will give you a new ring, and that will be the ring of a child of God. And today, you can be cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. Because the Lamb of God was slain for you and I. So that we could hear those words. Welcome home, my child. Welcome home. You're always welcome here. What are you waiting for? You don't have to wait anymore. The Father is running to you. You don't have to run to him. 